Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing how to build resilience within low resourced countries with special guests. Dr. Ann Huddock, President and CEO of Counterpart International, Thomas Teague, President and CEO of Direct Relief, and Peter Greer, President and CEO of Hope International. So thank you all for joining us. It's just great to see you. Uh, after this uh, this New Year's Happy New Year, and uh, and I'm going to uh, go over to you first. Uh, the thing that is so stunning to me every time I see the statistic, it, it just knocks me to the floor. Almost 700 million people, over nine percent of the world's population, live in extreme poverty. Now that's extreme poverty, meaning that their very survival is continually under threat. They don't know where they're going to find food. Their health is under threat. They, um, their families have uh, absolutely no security. And twice that number of people in 107 developing countries are multidimensionally poor, which means during the year, they, they suffer that same uh, extreme uh, poverty. Uh, and and that's, that, that's, that, that, that's huge. That's, if you look at it, that's 27% of the world's population are multidimensionally poor or extremely poor. So, Anne, could you please give us sort of a, the outlook from your perspective? Is that is that a, a an accurate description? Do we indeed have people? Twenty seven percent of the world is multidimensionally or extremely poor. Is that is that true? Unfortunately, Mark, it is true. And not to layer into it more negative news, but two point four billion women don't have the same rights as men. And there are 2 billion people who are living in conflict zones. So the challenges are vast. 2 billion people? Living in conflict zones. And that is, we are seeing as many live conflicts around the world now as we were at the end of World War II. So the, this just compounds the challenges of poverty from the economic lens that you laid out. When you have insecurity in terms of a fragile state and peace that doesn't hold or active conflict, and then you have women who generally are at the front lines of building the resilience in communities, and yet they don't have the same rights as men, the challenges only deepen. So I think to to tackle these challenges, one of the most important things you can do is to be engaged with communities at the most local level, to be really at the last mile and on the front lines, to be closest to the challenges where they exist. And that, to me, is where you find resilience and where you can build sustainable solutions. So your uh, counterpart international is about being at those front lines and building resilience and sustainable solutions. Is it is it? trying to get away from uh, from the solution of the moment and get to the point where you no longer have the people lurching from crisis to crisis? That's the only thing we do. So since we were founded almost 60 years ago, we were founded by a priest and a movie star. And we're a non-denominational organization, but I think that highlights for you the unlikely partnerships that we really believe are essential to solving these challenges. And at the same time, the only way we operate is to work in partnership with local leaders, local organizations, and local networks. So we never come in with an external solution. We come in to be, as our name says, the counterpart to people who are solving these challenges. And Tom, you take a different cut at, at direct relief. You're more on the on the uh, front lines of of catastrophe. Is that correct? Yeah, in a supportive way. I think you know direct relief's basic role is that of a support organization, and I think we focus on health and medical and and health and medical stuff primarily. I think we're um, kind of providing a large flow of medical material aid and increasingly financial support, about 50 to $60 million a year as a grant making organization, um, all to locally run groups, but really focused on health and medical. And often these high profile emergency, you know, Ukraine's a bit of an outlier because it's it's a war, um, which is not really our forte, but I think the general undergirding is that, um, you know, the. The economy, market economies work really well. I mean, they allocate resources efficiently. Um, they force competition. They, they they do all sorts of good things. They just have a really hard edge. So, I mean, markets fail too. So if there's no 
really likelihood of making money in a, in a in a country or a region or a community, the correct business decision is don't engage. You know, makes uh, it's, it's a bad human decision, but I think it. And I think the dilemma that <clears throat> we encounter is that the um, you know the the market actors are very good at their jobs. They have scale. They drive efficiency. They have good operations because they have to, or they won't be in business for too long. But it's only applied where there's a business rationale to apply them. So I think the great dilemma of our time is that we, we know how to solve problems. We solve them every day really well, but we only solve them if there's a business reason to do it, right? If it's, if it's just, in quotes, a compelling human reason to do it, we don't, despite having the tools. So I think we're trying to do it direct relief is kind of bring, crosswalk these these principles that that do well in the marketplace and apply them to places where the market isn't engaged or the market's failed or but you, where you need the resources um, to be mobilized, allocated and put to productive use. And we just do it for free. It, it basically, a, um, and we do a lot more. What The difference from direct relief, although, you know, we the only time we get attention is when there's a high profile emergency. It's basically what we do every day. And the difference in emergency, at a high profile emergency or any emergencies, you just do more of it faster. You know, you need more rap- rapid reallocation of resources to infuse into a place that's hit by a crisis. But I think that's, uh, we work in a lot of places, but doing much the same thing, always, if we're invited, um, if asked, and, you know, have to comply with dealing with prescription drugs is an extremely heavily regulated um, industry worldwide. Um, so I and think- you're, and, and you're basically functioning as a gap filler, right? I mean, your, your reference to, you know, business does things very well, right? You need a certain prerequisite. There needs to be certain civil cohesion. There needs to be a certain amount of peace. There needs to be a certain structure of law in there before you, before business can do that. So you're, you're filling gaps. Uh, Peter, Hope International is is also filling gaps, but it's also trying to empower local people to find their own solutions. Um, talk a little bit about how Hope approaches this problem set. Yeah, and I really appreciate it. Uh, and you said that Counterpart was founded by a movie star and a priest, uh, if I heard that right. Uh, right. Hope International was founded by a chiropractor and a home builder. So we have these uh, origin stories But you're exactly right, Mark. Initially, the mission of Hope was to do some of the direct relief after the fall of the Soviet Union. And then uh, it was a pastor in Zaporozhye, Ukraine, uh, that asked uh, for a change in approach. Um, This was a few years after the crisis, after the immediate relief uh, stage was over. And the questions of how do we then rebuild and uh, they recognized the missing ingredient was capital. And so that really is the founding story of Hope International to step into those places. And Thomas, I love what you said about the market not uh, functioning. We are kind of in that hybrid uh, transitionary place between the immediate relief that is necessary and the longer term economic development. We try to step into that into that zone and help from the relief to then uh, the rebuilding uh, mode by really providing capital to entrepreneurs to help them start and expand small businesses. So in some ways, it's a crazy full cycle founded in Ukraine in 1997, and now finding ourselves um, once again in Ukraine in that similar space of there still is the need for direct relief in the East, but we're also in the rebuilding stage uh, for much of the country by partnering with uh, local entrepreneurs. One of the things that I find to be very uh, wonderful about all of your organizations and other partner organizations throughout this sector is that you act as intermediaries between uh, 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 people with competencies, people with uh, people with financial means, donors, foundations, uh, other, uh, 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 people on the ground, civil society groups, governments, and so on, and and you're basically fostering a dialogue without interest. This is interesting, right? In other words, you're not players in trying to capture a particular resource of a particular country or a particular uh, political alliance. You have no interest in creating a uh, company on the ground um, that is going to be doing business or, or trading or any of that. So does you know, the question is, does that make you more 
uh, plastic in terms of changing with the times and responding to need, Anne, when, when you see those needs changing, are you more responsive because of that intermediary role where you're taking in a lot of different opinions and you're trying to figure out how to add value because that's your existence. Your existence is really about adding value. And, and once the problem is solved, counterpart needs to change its identity and do something else because you're trying to put yourself out of business all the time. Well, I would say, Mark, that even though we're nonpartisan, all development is political. And so we are constantly assessing the political landscape to make sure that, as our first principle says, we do no harm. And I think this is important because all the things Peter said are true about the ways in which NGOs operate. But we also have to be incredibly mindful of the fact that by coming into countries, especially countries that are in disruption, whether it's from conflict or a natural disaster, we can artificially inflate the job market. So it makes it impossible for local organizations, private sector or government to hire local staff because what our a salary. Fantastic op- what a fantastic observation. I'm so thankful that you made that. Could you please go into that particular point? Sure, I'd be happy to because it's something that we constantly consider and it, it gets to the question of sustainable solutions. So in our operations, we make sure that we're number one, working with local talent, that we're not jetting in outsiders who you know may have something to offer but aren't going to be there long term. Secondly, we make sure that our salary scales are really on a par with the country and we do market you know research to make sure that we're not artificially inflating salaries in the way I just described. There is nothing worse for a country's development than to see the brain drain from government or the private sector. I believe that NGOs like international NGOs like ours have a very important role to play and that there will always be challenges for us to come alongside organizations, leaders, networks to support the solutions. But if we put ourselves in the center of that equation, then, as you said, we will never be out of a job because we will be creating the dependencies and the distortions that actually are part of the problem, not the solution. So you're planning your exit from the moment you enter in a way that allows the value that you have delivered to be sustained in the absence of counterpart itself. In other words, you're you're strengthening civil society. That's such an important point, Tom. Could you talk a little bit about your take on uh, on this issue? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's, I mean, no one elected NGOs and that's always the, the challenge. Like to whom are we accountable? It's like not our country. Actually, we work in all 50 states and we live in one of them, um, you know, in California. But, you know, it's it's always the local reality, our kind of guiding principles, like who's going to live there in five years? Listen to them. They have the most stake in how this stuff shakes out and where the resources are going to be best directed. And we're privately funded entirely. So we have a lot of discretion. I think sometimes the, um, from my background in government, I mean, just the way the U.S. government foreign assistance program has been structured since 1961, it's, a, it's the carrot dimension of our foreign, U.S. foreign policy, uh, which is fine. You know, <clears throat> that's just the way it is. And that's funded a tremendous amount of the international development. So um, the, the reality is that it's, um, that's been a conscious choice to uh, extend U.S policy objectives through something affirmative with defense being the kind of the other side of the equation. But I think the private philanthropic effort to engage um, kind of the people who have the money, actually, and particularly more with the wealth concentration, I think it's essential to get them engaged. We all live on the same planet and they know how to do things well. They happen to do them in the business environment. But um, you look at some of the effects of climate and kind of the advances in power, and we look at it through the lens of health, like you cannot provide modern health services without, uh, you can't diagnose and treat patients without power. So, you know, how do you take, you know, what's a thriving business and growing business with um, with energy and storage uh, and, and apply that in a low resource setting? We're doing a lot of that on a philanthropic basis to power community health centers in the U.S. Uh, to power uh, health facilities with solar and battery storage in developing countries. And I think that's business, you know, a lot of that's been learned in business is being applied in it for non-business purposes, for humanitarian purposes. But I think, you know, we have that same lens, who's going to live here, who are we doing this for? 
um, and remove our, we were not founded by a priest. Um, we were founded by a, a war immigrant refugee 75 years ago who uh, was Estonian and, was, and Hitler tried to recruit as an industrialist. And he famously called Hitler an idiot, which is why he became a refugee and fled to California with some of his wealth intact. So that, that was the roots of direct relief, um, kind of a war immigrant businessman who saw that what was needed in bombed out post-war Europe were things that we knew how to do as a society but um, so he was trying to do it himself and engage people like him. So I think we still tried to retain that engagement of private people, private business with a broad lens, you know, of humanitarian, the humanitarian impulse and put those together without screwing up either the market or supplanting the role of government. It's complementary and it's 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 got to be locally driven or it's, it, it fails inherently. And uh, Peter, uh, we got a question. How, how are you building the local capacity for for uh, civil society? Uh, we got this from from Lars Benson. Uh, 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 Lars Benson. Um, how do you build local capacity? Could you could you give us a sense of your programs and how you create instead of codependence, independence? Yeah, I mean, so our our model is fairly simple. Uh, we have two different. Uh, approaches. One are uh, microfinance institutions uh, that are really designed to provide access to capital and a safe place to save funds for individuals that typically have been excluded from the formal financial sector. So my guess is all of us at some point have received the benefit of a mortgage for our home or an, an investment uh, to start, whether it's a side hustle or our main hustle. So we're really- just putting our money in the bank and being sure that it's there. Exactly right. Exactly right. And unfortunately, that is not available to so much of, of the world. So that's our one model. And then the other model is more of an informal approach. We do church centered savings groups where we're not making external investments of capital, but helping individuals save their own money. And then that becomes their investment pool. They become the investment bankers for each other at a micro, micro level. Um, so I was with one group that started with, there were 23 women, they each started with 10 cents each. So they had $2 and 30 cents, and that was their initial corpus. Um, and then fast forward a number of years, uh, they've got into a much broader array of businesses. And, and it was so much fun to spend time and hear their stories. But uh, so we're about the capital mobilization uh, so that individuals have the capacity. And I love even the theme of, of today's webinar, Mark, and, and just this idea about resilience. And I think sometimes we can think, what can we do to help grow resilience? But I would probably twist it a little bit and say individuals that have been living in uh, lower income situations, living in war, living in they have already had to learn resilience. They have already demonstrated that. And so we go in with a very high view of their existing capacity and simply say, how do we, how do we remove some of the barriers that takes that latent potential, that ability, that capacity that they have learned and then say, let's help remove some of the barriers. So what do we do to do that? It's about capital. It's about training. And for us, it's really about a very high view of the capacity, worth, dignity of every single person that we are so privileged to partner with. So, Peter, who are the experts? Who are the experts in, in the constellation of, of your partnerships? Who are the experts? No, it's, it's the families that we serve. It's the individuals living in the places that we serve. High level of uh, autonomy, high level of, of trust. And this is kind of what Muhammad Yunus, when he created the Grameen Bank, was really so instrumental in, in reminding us is that even though someone might not have a credit history or formal collateral, if they have their relationships, if they have their character intact, they're willing to co-sign on each other's loans. That creates the system uh, that says, I trust you so much that I'm willing to put my name on the line that if you don't repay, I will step in and repay for you um, on that. So, so who's the expert? It's that group that really does the underwriting process for the other members of that group. Um, and that just changes everything. It changes us, you know, sitting here in, in the United States, trying to look at loan applications and to make a judgment between someone that's going to uh, buy some goats or chickens and someone who's going to start a small store and someone who's going to do light manufacturing. 
We are not the experts to make those underwriting decisions, but the community um, that lives alongside them, they certainly are. And so that's really what we've been able to um, just build on uh, a model and methodology that says, let's provide access to capital and training to entrepreneurs with a model that says you're in control um, and you're responsible uh, for, for the, uh, the use of the funds and for the repayment. I'd like to talk a little bit about definitions and cross-cultural collaborations because different societies have different definitions of, 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 of terms. Let's talk about the term corruption, right? When, when an American talks about corruption and someone from Japan or someone from France or someone from Brazil or someone from Israel or someone from the Arab world, uh, Egypt, Different terms can have completely different meanings and behaviors can can be different. One person's normal way of doing business is another person's corruption, right? How do you ensure, uh, Tom and Anne, how do you ensure that you're, as you're bringing these multinational teams together, that people are communicating in a way that allows for collaboration, allows for respect, allows for exchange, and allows for concerted effective action. Tom, you want to you start uh, with this? And Anne, could you jump in? Sure. Yeah, you know, we had a lot of um, prescription medications, right? So it's about $2 billion on a wholesale basis of flow of stuff. Um, and thankfully, I mean, among the maturation industry is inventory control and batch level tracking for a pill. So, you know, we have to 20, I guess, 15 years ago, we had to put in SAP, this big enterprise system, because that's how big, you know, pharmaceutical companies uh, run their businesses for a reason, right? We have to comply with not only the regulatory framework, but also it gives you a sense of um, what you have and where it is and it's trackable and traceable. And it's getting more and more advanced each year. So I think um, the the guard against uh, corruption, because yeah, two billion dollars, you take it, let me sell it. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we benefit from all the drugs are expensive; they're hard to monetize. I mean, you know, it's it, you ha- it, it's for, it's expensive, but it's for a specific purpose. So you can't take a a biological therapy that's developed for a particular cancer, although it's worth a lot of money, it costs a lot of money, it's hard to monetize that. It's only good for a particular application. So I think there's some inherent controls that um, we've had to put in place that basically parallel those of industry to kind of maintain integrity in the supply chain. When it comes to money, um, you know, which I think in providing financial support, it's, I said, it's about $60 million a year and just straight out grant making. That's where it's tough. I mean, you got to do a lot on the front end. I think a lot of it is to, you know, why do people want money? They take money and they convert it to goods and services. So I think um, we have to look at kind of the quality of the organization. These are not individual, you know, loans. These are grants to other organizations for operational purposes. And again, the controls there uh, to avoid the corruption, the self-interested kind of extraction of philanthropic money is to make sure that the organization that's funded has proper controls and often it's for a project, as I mentioned, a solar and storage project that lends itself to, you know, um, parsed payments upon the achievement of objectives. Um, and those That's really interesting. So what you did there, uh, Tom, I really admire that uh, what you did. You took the the word and you distilled it down to principles, right? Instead of taking corruption, you co- you turned it into well. We don't know what corruption is. I mean, you're, you didn't quite say this, but but it, it's implied. We don't know what corruption is, but we know what extraction is. Mm. We know what a taking is. So what you what you did there, it was interesting. You 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 said we're not going to allow means to be taken for purposes that that those means are not intended for, yes. right? So you're putting in systems that. You're not you're not attending to the word corruption. You're actually attending to the impact that an act would have to extract and remove resource and 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 use it for an unintended purpose. That's that's a, that's a really interesting and very sophisticated way. It kind of finesses the the meaning of a particular word. Um, 
Uh, and how, how do you take a look at those kinds of changes so that you can, like Tom just did, he did kind of a jujitsu, right? He, he took it to um, a, a different level of abstraction and dealt with first principles. How do you deal with those kinds of, of, cha- of differences amongst members of your team in terms of how they think and how they operate? I'll tell you a very quick story just to illustrate this. In 1990, I was living and working in Sierra Leone, and we got a grant from a very large donor based in Europe. That money went to the community that was very far removed from the capital city. It was very resource poor. And at the same time, the headman died from that village. So the community members took that money and they used it for a funeral to give a send off that they felt was culturally appropriate. In the situation we were in, this was not counterpart. This was an indigenous NGO I was volunteering with. They had to explain to the donor why this was an appropriate use of the grant money, because given the purposes of the grant, that this was what the community's first needs were. And of course, the donor said, this is corruption. You took our money and you used it for something completely different from what we said. So this led me all those years ago to have, I think, the three principles that you have to keep first in mind. Number one, you have to have trust-based relationships. That is key to making sure that resources go where they should go. Number two, as my story just illustrated, you really have to have a cultural understanding of what is a priority, what are the needs, and how do these things differ between donor and recipient, between the different parties who are in this equation. And last but not least, you have to have clarity around the absolutes. So we at Counterpart, we do take U.S. government funding and we are guided and adhere to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. There are some hard lines there that we can't cross. So when we work with communities, they need to understand what those lines are and we need to be sure they're comfortable with that. And if they're not, that's okay. And then we won't work together in partnership under that grant. That's really interesting. So what you're doing is you're you're coming in with an understanding of what you can do and what you can't do. You explain it, right? Your your counterpart is empowered to make their parts of the decision as are you, right? And then together if you can come to some arrangement, you can then partner um, in, in a way that that has a lot of clarity. So clarity is basically your approach is, is to create lines of communication, work it through until people understand what the relationship is. Transparency and, you- and accountability is key to all of this. Anti-corruption efforts, you know, can't thrive in sunlight. And so having having that clarity around what are our goals, what are your goals, and how do we work together? And as long as we can communicate openly and set those standards together, or to understand where donors have set them or foreign governments have set them, then I think you know you find fewer challenges. That's not to say there aren't uh, issues that arise. And then I think those are best dealt with because we're working with local leaders, local organizations. They know and they understand in different ways than we do how to solve these problems in the countries where where they're living and, and where they're guided by the cultural norms or the legal issues or whatever else might be driving it. Um, there are a couple of, of, uh, of uh, uh, polls that we, we've had, uh, which which are quite interesting. I just want to share them, and then I'd like to go around the table for final comments. We asked, what do you believe are the three main causes of poverty in low-income countries? And it's interesting, the the uh, two that received the, uh, the most uh, focus are lack of education, local and government, uh, lack of education, I'm, I'm sorry, and then corruption, local and government. Uh, interesting interesting uh, view there. Um, we also did uh, a, uh, a question, do you support organizations that work in low-income countries? And 43% of this audience uh, said, yes, they do. And uh, finally, uh, who should bear primary responsibility for assist- assisting vulnerable populations outside of our country? This is very interesting. NGOs and other nonprofit organizations, 60%. There's a huge, huge support for nonprofits as opposed to governments. Um, very, very interesting. So let's go around the table because I'd like to go back to our original uh, uh, topic, which was the 27% of the world's population, and it's not evenly spread, of course, uh, live in either extreme poverty or, or in uh, endemic poverty. 
let's talk a little bit about how do we solve this. I go from the perspective that systems exist because they have reached a certain stability of interest, sort of like the free market that Tom was, was mentioning. If we have 27% of the world's population poor, it must be because there are interests here throughout the world that allow that to, to happen. Um, I'd like to just have each of your takes. Um, let's let's start with that. Let's go to Peter and we'll end up with Tom. I'd like to, I, I'd like to have each of your takes on how do we actually go from spending uh, our time managing the problem to actually solving it on a global basis? Is this the kind of thing that that only governments can do, or are there is there a different relationship that we have to foster amongst people? And what do you think? I think we have to start with the dignity of every human life, and we have to recognize the ecosystem that comes in to support that. And so that includes government, private sector, and civil society. I also think that poverty is really driven by dehumanization. So really getting to a place where we can talk about global citizenship and not isolationism, I think is how we begin to address root causes. Peter, what's, what's your take? Hey, you know, it's interesting. Whenever, uh, whenever I have the opportunity to share, my, my default lens is Hope International, the organization that I work for, and we're part of the faith-based community. And so I'm thinking about the role of faith and, um, and economic development and investment. Like that's the, that's the lens that I come in. Um, but then you have the opportunity to get your gaze a little bit bigger. And the problem of poverty is so complex that any conversation about which one piece is most important is always going to be inadequate. Poverty is complex. It is a web. And I wish there was a, uh, an option in the survey, Mark. Uh, option F, all of the above. Um, who should bear responsibility? F, all of the above, uh, because that's the reality. Government matters. If there's not a rule of law, there's never going to be any investment. And even organizations like ours, I hate the fact that we had to exit some countries because the, the environment uh, became impossible. And, and I hate the impact on the communities and the staff when we had to exit Government matters, rule of law matters, um, relief matters, responding to education matters. And so I, I might turn it a little bit of saying the biggest need, I would say, is to get out of our own silo and to say, if poverty is a complex web, how can the response be just as, as an integrated uh, web approach? And the relief organizations, what does it look like for them to do great work and then partner with the development organizations to come in next? Um, and uh, that's, that's where my mind goes of what would it look like if we were able to extend our gaze beyond the borders of our own organizations and say, who else do we need to be joining in in the broader piece of poverty alleviation? Um. What, what is your take on this, this issue? How do we solve global poverty? <laughs> how do you solve global? Well, I agree with everything that's been said and nice question where how do we global, solve global stupidity first? Uh, that'll help solve global <laughs> poverty. But no, I think both what Ann and, and Peter said are right. I think, I think there's just a redefinition of roles. You know, I think a lot of what we're seeing right now, I, enormous wealth concentration over the past three or four years, mainly in private hands. I think the ossification of some post-war institutions like the UN it had a really hard time stepping up in COVID and reacting fast. So I think the speed and um, the virtues that exist in the private sector, I think are good. I mean, they move fast, um, kind of they're, they're flexible to the circumstances. Uh, NGOs are great. It's just the scale issue. As you mentioned, the poverty is a huge scale. So I think, you know, as... There, there's no scenario in which the engagement of p private people who can who control the wealth in the world, you cannot have any solution unless they engage, whether it's forced by government. And they're very good at avoiding taxes if they don't want to pay it. So I think, you know, what, what both Peter and Ann alluded to is there's got to be a re-engagement uh, just of, of, among folks like this notion that, look, we're all in this together. I mean, the, the, the notion of resiliency that we started with. I mean, California, where I live, it's the richest state and the richest country in the history of the world. Are we resilient? I don't know. We just had some rain that 
made it a little dicey out here. So, I mean, also gut check some of these principles. Like it's it's an ongoing struggle, but I think we have the tools, we have the resources. It's just we're it's such a government centric focus, almost exclusively. If you look at television, and I think what Peter and Ann referred to is that if you work in this venue. That's obviously important, but the work, the drive, the personal passion and commitment is not coming from, you know, governments. It's coming from people who are trying to make their lives better. And I think to figure out how to swing in, support them with resources they don't have access to is really the only way I see going forward with uh, in applying some of the systems that have been developed uh, along the way. So I don't know if that'll solve uh, global poverty, but um doing more of what we're doing right now. I don't think, you know, some of it's actually worked really well over the past 40 years. Um, but I think we're just looking at extreme wealth concentration and a big question of what role governments are going to play vis-a-vis -vis markets and other actors. I think that's the, the question of our times. I think we all have to shift our attitudes until we see in the impoverished state of another, our own family members and respond in that way. Um, and, provide respect to others that we wish for ourselves. Um, this, this, this situation is going to continue as long as it's me, me, me. I, I mean, part of this me, me, me means that you, you, you is, uh, is going to be in a distressed state, right? As soon as we, we start to balance those with power, look at those without power and see in that person someone that needs support. Um, I, 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 I think we, the change is in ourselves and it's in our power to, to actually make that change. Dr. Ann Paddock, uh, President and CEO of Counterpart International, Tom, Thomas Teague, uh, President and CEO of Direct Relief, and Peter Greer, President and CEO of Hope International. I'd like to thank you all and your staffs and your boards and your funders, uh, the people on the ground and the people who provide support for the work that you do. It's just so wonderful to have you here to share your knowledge with us. Thank you so much for your insights. Really Thank appreciate you, it. Mark, for the opportunity. And thanks to Thomas and Peter. It was great to be with you.